So uh, I want to go ahead and just share a little bit today uh, out of First Samuel uh, chapter five, and um, uh, I'm going to be using a little bit of poetic license in in my sharing on this, but I feel like there is something in this uh, from the Lord for us. Uh, the name of it is, What's Causing Your Ups, Downs, and Defeats? And um, in 1 Samuel chapter 5, starting with verse 1, And the Philistines took the ark of God, and they brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod, when the Philistines took the Ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon. That's their God. So this is the, it's, it's the temple for their God. And set it up uh, by Dagon. So they put the Ark of the Covenant that they got from Israel when they defeated him. And they put it in their temple beside their God. And um, the Ark of the Covenant was there. And Dagon was there and um, set it up by Dagon in verse 3 and and when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow meaning early in the morning behold Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord hmm. before the ark of the Lord and they took Dagon, and they set him in his place again. And when they had arose early on the morn, meaning the next, next day, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Uh, it's interesting here that it mentions that his hands are cut off because uh, in our, in the next several verses that we're going to read, um, we're going to hear about the hand of God. We're going to hear about the hands of God and Dagon losing his hands and yet God's hands moving. Verse 6, um, <clears throat> But the hand of the Lord, there it is almost immediately, But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emerods, even Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not abide with us. <laughs> They're starting to figure something out here. It shall not abide with us. Um, and... Um, uh, with us for his hand and there it is again is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God and then finally uh, verse 8 and 9 they sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said what shall we do with the ark of the co of God of the God of Israel and they answer let the ark of the God of Israel be carried about unto Gath this is another city of the Philistines. And they carried the ark of, of the God of Israel about thither. And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord <laughs> was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great. And they had emerods in their secret parts, which if you don't know what emerods are, this is a very desperate attack of God. He gave them hemorrhoids. <laughs> and that's what that word is in their secret parts. Okay, so, you know, like I said, a little poetic license here, but there's, you know, in the, in the lives of many Christians, there's a lot of ups and downs. There's a lot of defeats. There's a lot of, uh, you know, things going on uh, in their lives. And uh, many, many Christians really don't understand, you know, why that's happening. Um, usually the first thing is, is we've sinned, and, and yet, yet, you know, there are many different angles from this. I'm going to be sharing on particularly one particular angle. But the, the historical background is that the, the Ark of the Covenant 
where the presence of God was, it represents the presence of God, and that's where his presence dwelt, uh, was taken in battle uh, when the Philistines beat Israel in that battle. <clears throat> and uh, they were carrying the ark, hoping that, you know, just by carrying the ark, just by having the ark out there in the battlefield, that uh, they would uh, win the battle, and they didn't because there was some major junk going on in, in uh, Israel um, with uh, the high priest and his sons, and it was really, really horrible stuff. So, you know, they grab it up and they take it out there because, you know, we'll, we believe that God wants to save us uh, instead of him wanting to show forth our false temples and our Dagons and our false um, images that we have formed usually about God. So um, the Ark of the Lord was captured by the Philistines and, and God allowed it. Why did God allow that? Again, because uh, there were some terrible things going on and he, he, gave, he gave them up unto that. And so, um, uh, in the New Testament, we have the example of John uh, in his gospel, but also in his epistles. And John says, keep yourself from idols. And I've, I remember many, many years ago reading that and thinking, you know, we don't have idols, you know, we don't have little gods and stuff like that. <clears throat> but it's just they, another word they use was images from uh, certain images. And um, uh, I wrote down one false image might be a misconception of God and his purpose in our lives, that that could be a false image, that we, we see it wrong. That we, to put it plainly, that we, we don't really see his heart and we don't see what's really in his heart. We are so busy living in this earth and wanting him to see our heart and wanting him to see our situation. And um, instead of conforming to the image of Christ, we want God to conform to our image. And so um, just a couple of things I wrote. Have, have you idolized God as something he doesn't want to be? And I don't know if that's a really a thought that many Christians have that, you know, they, you know, they've idolized God, but in a different image than, than what he really is. And I mean, that would be like somebody knowing you, but they don't, they know you according to what they think you are instead of what you really are. And that, that could be hurtful or sad on, on a lot of different fronts. Um, are you using him as if he's, uh, he is the good side of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? instead of him saying, don't touch that tree, um, whether it was good or evil, don't eat of it. And yet we're, we've made him the good side of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Um, or maybe we've had, made idols that, um, that appear like Jesus. But again, it misses his heart. So why did the glory depart? Why did God leave? You know, he's looking, he's looking for a certain heart. He, he's not just, well, I'm all for Israel no matter what, or all for, you know, our church or your church or this or that, or all for me, just no matter what. He longs after a certain image that, that most of you know, which I've spoken about many times before. Um, so one of the reasons was, um, this is just me reading some of the, the notes I have here, focusing on externals. We look at the areas of external problems in our life instead of letting him point out certain things that we, we would never maybe even imagine because it has more to do with his heart. But we look at, at certain external problems for help instead of looking to him to drive out our Dagons, which is the name of that idol. Uh, 
it then becomes a war, not just against our external problem areas, but us against God for letting the real issue remain in us because we're, we're, we're so busy dealing with this little thing over here that we're letting Dagon remain in our temple. <clears throat> and um, so uh, the, my title, subtitle here is Seeking to Get Our Dagons uh, and Jesus to Get Along. Seeking to Get Dagon and the Ark of the Covenant to get along, seeking to get our false images and things to get along with the Ark of the Covenant. So we bring them in and we set them side by side. Um, and so Jesus is placed there, you know, with him. And um, okay, well, they brought in Jesus, if you will, but Dagon is still there. And um, and it's, and it's in Dagon's temple. And so uh, what they did was they put them together and then they left uh, at nighttime and they went in, to their own houses and whatever. And then in the morning they came in and Dagon is bowed down on the floor in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that happened at night. You know, and every dark thing that, that's going on, everything that's in that dark room is going to have to bow down eventually. Everything that's in that dark room is going to have to bow down before the Ark of the Covenant. So Dagon bows. Verse 3 says, When they of Ashdod arose early in the morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the earth. So for them... Maybe for us, for them, their ups and downs just has just begun. This is not the end of their ups and downs of what they're going to have. Uh, just getting Dagon to bow is not enough. <laughs> See? And, and sometimes we do that. We, we kind of have a broken time at church or something, and, and we, we finally get our Dagon to, to bow down to the real Lord and everything. But next thing you know, he's back up again. And that's, that's exactly what happens here. It says, uh, and they took Dagon and set him up in his place again. Mm, okay, that his place thing. He didn't have any place with the, with the Lord. He's not supposed to be mixed in with that. So my next subtitle is Lifting Dagon Back Up. All right. What if what we're trying to support and keep together is by God's order falling down and bowing down to something higher? God is bringing it down not to be lifted up in our lives as equal or even or especially not higher than God. So... Under what condition did this happen where he fell down? It says, When they of Ashdod arose early on the morning, behold, Dagon was fallen on his face to the earth. Notice um, that instead of it being a big outward show, like during the daytime when all of, all of the Philistines were gathered around and they saw it fall down, it was... It was not in that. It was not uh, in having this big show going on. It was while there was deep darkness. And that's what happened at the cross. The greatest thing happened in deep darkness. And so, uh, and that's where the enemy was defeated. And in verse 4, it says, And when they arose early on the morning, morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon, and both of his palms of his hands were cut off before the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. So, okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to try to get our Dagon to bow down before the Lord, but we're going to keep him in there. And and uh, that ain't going to happen So, because you set him right back up. And so then the next day you go in there and uh, you say, well, we're going to cut back 
we're going to cut back our day going. <laughs> Sorry, but I told you there had to be some poetic license on this. So I wrote, if in a time of trouble we bow our Dagons down, just know that as soon as you lift it back up, more trouble will be on the way. And why? Because, because there's no brokenness. There's no brokenness involved in that. But for those who misunderstand this, they will keep wanting and having to manage what keeps falling down. And that's, you know, it's because it doesn't belong there, but we're trying to manage it, our, our idols or our images that we have of certain things. Um, if once it is reduced to a stump, we still value it or, uh, or higher than God, uh, then there's going to be even more trouble. Um, so, what is the real problem? The real problem is we keep propping our Dagons back up, okay? And we keep, but we keep continuing to have our ups and downs and trying to figure out why this isn't working and I've got the Ark of the Covenant, I've got the Lord in there and, and uh, but we won't really face it. Maybe we've got some idols in there. Um, so I wrote, it's obvious that when Dagon goes down, those who have enthroned him keep having to prop him back up again. This is part of the ups and downs that I'm talking about. <clears throat> but we don't give up on what we want. We don't give up on what we want to honor. We don't want, we won't give up on what we want to be blessed. If it falls down in front of the Lord, we'll get it back up. Or we'll cut it back, as I said. So this time the head, the place of thinking, is cut off, and the hands, where we put our hands to it, are cut off. And I, I was just thinking of the Holy of Holies. I was thinking about David's, David's tabernacle, too. But I was thinking about the Holy of Holies, um, the Lord alone in the Holy of Holies. If the Lord's alone in the Holy of Holies, there's no contrast. But when you place him beside other things like what happened in Dagon's temple, you place him beside that, um, God will start dealing with your other things or my other things. Okay. Just in there by himself, well, he's just, but you start having other things in there. So they cannot stand and you will eventually be confronted with a choice to keep your stump. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Uh, or get rid of what uh, what God, you know, what God wants to get rid of by he he's dealing. So you can see that the Lord's dealing in this situation. I mean, first he's got him bowed down. Next thing he's got his head cut off. Uh, I mean, what are these Philistines thinking when they come in there? Um, and uh, but I know what. I know what the Lord's thinking, you know, the Father's thinking, you know, the Ark of the Covenant must increase and Dagon must decrease. And he's working toward that end in our lives. So, just to summarize, all right, the problem is we have Dagon and the Ark in the same temple. This was, if you, if you think about it historically, this was a great victory for the Philistines. They, they captured the Ark of the Covenant. We've got the Ark of the Covenant. We've got their God and our God. <laughs> but God doesn't play that game. See? So, I mean, in their mind, they've, we've improved our temple. You know, we can say that, you know. Uh, but Dagon will not be converted. Unlike Dagon's situation, the old man must be crucified, else he will continue to usurp even though Christ be brought in. So, in so many ways, we're all like Philistines. We let Dagon live in us, but one day we brought Jesus in, right? Before we got saved, we let Dagon live in there. But at a certain juncture in our life, we let Jesus come in. 
The difference is that they got rid of God's presence because they wanted to keep their defeated false image. But we get rid of Dagon. There's a big difference between the coming of the Ark of the Covenant into Dagon's house in contrast to bringing Jesus in to David's tabernacle. Remember? You remember that? This is, this is a, I don't, I can never have enough time to deal with this. But this is just the continuing story of what this whole thing with Dagon being down there in their temple uh, with the Ark of the Covenant. And they want, finally want to get rid of it and David takes it and he brings it into David's tabernacle. And there, you, you can read it from the mouth of the Lord, as it were, in Psalms. He loved it. He loved that. So, uh, we want the day to come that one day we will be David's tabernacle, not the house of Dagon with Jesus inside. Our victory is when we allow him to be enthroned within as the only hope of glory over all else. And finally, so what's causing your ups and downs and defeats? Maybe you or me are all of us or none of us. Maybe you're trying to fit Jesus into a temple set aside for something else. Because our body is the temple of the Lord. Or maybe you keep propping up wrong images that God keeps knocking down. So we can pray over this, you know, we don't, we're not always aware of these things. We're not always aware of, of issues within us. But as I thought about it, as I was thinking about this before, you know, hand, I was thinking, you know, when, when the Ark of the Covenant, when Jesus was brought into that temple with Dagon, uh, I remembered immediately when Jesus went into the temple and there were all these sheep and all these things they were selling and, and, and money changers and all this stuff, wrong stuff in the temple. And Jesus, like, like the Ark of the Covenant, if you will, Jesus drove it out. Jesus drove out all that stuff that was, was in the temple. And, and in the example of this story, God is the one who dealt with Dagon. So our hope is not just in identifying specifically exactly everything that could possibly be wrong in us. Uh, that's a wrong road to take anyway. I mean, it really is. It's a wrong road to take. The road to take is to have our focus and our heart on the Lord, desiring more of Him and less of us, regardless of what, the, what it is. It's like you know, less of my good things and let it be him instead of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Let it be him. And so our hope isn't in finding out what's wrong and defeating it. That's not it. Our hope is in the Lord increasing inside of us. And as he does, he'll defeat all of the money changers. He'll defeat all of the things that are in there because, because we want that. That's what we want, more of Jesus. And, and he will even take down the idols. He'll even take down the idols. And not only that, but when he does that, he'll even make the Philistines want to get rid of us because we can't, you know, too much Jesus. <laughs> but in our hearts, there can never, ever, ever, ever be too much Jesus. Never could there be. So let's just pray and put this in the hands of the Lord. Let's trust him and let's not be condemned. But let us be glorious, gloriously in joy that we know that when he comes into that temple, he's going to cleanse the temple. And he's in us and he's doing that. So, Father, we love you. We bless you. And, Father, thank you just for the information that, that we, there are things in us that 
we may be trying to get to bow down to you, to the Ark of the Covenant within us. And that's not our, that's not our goal. We don't want it to bow down. We want it out. Father, we realize that, that we may be trying to cut back certain things, but that's the work of our own arms and flesh and mind to be able to do that. We have no strength to do that, but we, we trust you. And, and when, the, when the light shines, uh, Dagon, his head is gone and his hands and his ability to work is, is gone also. And now we can just depend on you and know you. Father, I just thank you for the heart of this people. I thank you for the heart of this people that long after you, that cry after you, that, that seek you, Father. I thank you that when we see wrongs in this world, Father, we, we don't ignore it or, or, or take sides or anything else. We cry out. We weep from our hearts and our eyes. More of Jesus in this world. More of Jesus in this country. Less of us. Less, of, less American and more Christ, the Son of God. More Lamb of God. So thank you, Father. Thank you for the loving arms that reach toward you in this fellowship and in this gathering that we have here. Thank you for the, the tears that flow for the desperate need for more of your Son so that these things wouldn't even happen. And Father, we love you. We love you. And we thank you to be together like this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.